A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering the material for lab practical number one for biology 2421, that's microbiology for science majors. Let's go ahead and get started. Looks like we have on the first day of class we had introduction, safety, check-in, uh, but uh, let's go to this lab here. Use of the microscope bacterial smears. Forget you could rotate this lens, you could rotate it around and it would read uh, either zero or a for bright field it would read um, it would read DF for dark field it would rate read pH 1 2 3 4 for uh, phase contrast um, so don't don't forget that this this condenser can be rotated around and that changes the type of light microscopy that the microscope is performing so there might be a question like what type of microscopy is this and you know if it's if it's zero or a that's uh, bright field if it's df that's dark field and if it's ph that's phase contrast also when it's on bright field you see this little box here this little rectangle that it that is actually called the iris uh, whereas the condenser, remember the condenser's function was to focus a cone of light onto the specimen. The iris, which is this little rectangle here, um, this little dial that goes back and forth, or not dial, I'm sorry, it, it's this little lever that goes back and forth. This is the iris. It restricts the light to the specimen and it increases contrast as you restrict the light. You know, so, you, so the iris restricts the light it's a diaphragm whereas the condenser itself the condenser uh, focuses a cone of light onto the specimen so please know the difference between a condenser and a iris you know you could have you know identify this or identify this you know you could have a sticker here identify this so what is this up here this is a objective lens remember you got the 10x the 40x, 100x lens. And also, what if I were to ask you, what is the total magnification of the microscope? You should be able to tell me, oh, it's it's set to 10x, so uh, the, the objective is 10x, my oculars are 10x, so 10 times 10 is 100x total magnification. If it's set on the 40x objective, then the total magnification would be 40 times 10, 400x magnification. If it's on my 100x objective, then it's 100 times 10, 1,000 times magnification. Don't forget that. Uh, what else? So here are the objective lenses. Please know what the objective lenses are. This is the stage where the platform goes. Uh, this is the clasp. Uh, you should know these the difference between these two. This is the bigger knob here. The bigger knob is the coarse adjustment knob. Number two, the smaller knob uh, is the fine adjustment knob. Number four is the light switch. Um, 13 is the stage. 11 is the clasp. Okay, so good stuff there. 10 is the ocular lens. And don't forget the magnification of the ocular lens is 10x, 9 is the rotating nose piece, uh, again 8 is the objective lenses, number 7, uh, it depends what it's pointing at, but this whole thing is the condenser which focuses a cone of light onto the specimen, and number 7, if it's pointing specifically at that little lever, that little tiny lever that slides back and uh, left and right, that's the iris for restricting the light. Uh, number five is the base, I believe, the base. Number 12, these are the dials to actuate the stage, the stage adjustment dials. Number three is the arm, the arm of the microscope. Okay, so please know the, the parts of the microscope. And, and here they're actually labeled right here for you. Um, know the parts of the microscope um, know how to obtain total magnification of the microscope. Know how know the functions of all of the parts of the microscope. Um, know um, remember that 
oil should only touch the 100x objective, none of the other objectives. Remember that, um, oh, remember the term parfocal? Um, oh, I guess it's trying to open up a link. Uh, know the term parfocal? Parfocal meaning that the specimen remains nearly in focus as you switch from uh, objective lens to objective lens. Uh, know that you only use the course adjustment knob with the 10x objective lens, none of the other objective lenses. Know that you use only lens paper on the lenses, no, no, no Kim wipes or any other type of paper. Um, I'm just trying to remember all the things that we had discussed during this lab. Uh, remember, um, yeah, so again, d only use the course adjustment knob with the 10x objective in place. Otherwise, the, the microscope's parfocal, you only need the fine adjustment knob. Know why you heat fix. Remember, why do you heat fix? Definitely know that you heat fix your specimen, uh, you know, your smear. You hit heat fix your smear to adhere the cells to the slide so they don't wash away. Um, now let's talk about smears a little bit. Um, with smears, please know again why do you heat fix? Um, know about uh, know about dyes. Remember, crystal violet is a basic dye. You should know that basic dyes have a positive charge, and that's that's good for staining cells because cells typically have a negative charge to them, to at the cell surface. So you can see general cell shape with you know negatively charged cell surface positively charged basic dyes right so um, general dyes simple stains tend to be basic dyes basic dyes okay what else do we talk about um, let's see uh, all right that's a lot of good stuff to know about the microscope please know all those things about the microscope um, let me move on to simple staining because I believe that was also a part of, yeah, bacterial smear, simple staining. Let's talk about this. Simple staining. Um, again, why did you heat fix? Um, yes, we, we talked about this. Please know under the microscope uh, the shapes of bacteria. Remember bacilli or rod-shaped bacterium capsule shaped bacterium right that's bacilli rod shape capsule shape and then cocci which are spherical or round shape cocci um, and then no arrangement strepto is the prefix strepto means chains of chains of so here you can see streptobacillus you see chains of bacillus streptobacilli um, if you have chains of cocci, that would be streptococci or streptococcus. Uh, if you have clusters, like here I see a little cluster of uh, cocci, so that would be staphylococci. Staphylococci would be clusters of cocci. All right. Great. I think that's about it from day one. Use of the microscope, bacterial smears. I think that's great. Let's move on to day two. Media prep, aseptic transfers, and dilution. With regard to media prep, um, please know the difference between um, a TSA plate, you know, be able to identify a TSA plate, be able to identify a TSA slant, be able to identify a TSA deep, and be able to identify a TSB broth, you know, t a tube of TSB broth. You should know why we autoclave uh, substances. Why do we autoclave substances? Is to keep them, uh, to sterilize them. Also, one thing you should definitely know is when we incubate a plate, uh, a TSA plate, Remember, we incubate the plates upside down, and I need you to know for the practical that there are two reasons to do so. Remember, it, it prevents the two C's, condensation and contamination. Condensation means 
pooling of water or water droplets onto your specimen. You know, when you incubate upside down, you prevent that. Uh, and then number two is contamination with dust or other debris that gets into the into the plate. So you limit those two things. I think that's about it from media prep. Um, aseptic transfers, you should know why you work aseptically. Um, you should know about the general concept of aseptic transfer. Uh, let's see. You should know what a, you know, w w uh, like if I showed you a plate, you should be able to tell me whether the plate has pure culture or if there's a contaminant. What if I showed you a plate of E. coli and all the colonies looked identical, but then there was a fuzzy colony off to the side. Well, that would suggest that perhaps mold got onto the plate, you see? So that would uh, indicate contamination, which would suggest that proper aseptic technique was not followed. Okay, what about uh, uh, labs three and four with regard to dilution? Let's talk a little bit about labs three and four dilution. Oh, um, one thing, before I move on to dilution, you should know why we do a streak plate, right? Remember, we do a streak plate for isolated colonies. So you should know why we do a streak plate and what's, what a good streak plate looks like. Um, also, you should know the difference between a streak plate, a smear, uh, I'm sorry, a, a streak plate, a spread plate where you spread the bacterium all over the surface so you're only going to get colonies at the surface and a pour plate a pour plate if you pour uh, if, if you add bacteria and then pour the agar on top in a plate the bacteria will be inside of the agar so if there's bacteria inside of the agar um, that's a pore plate. If the bacteria are only on top and they're evenly spread out, that's a spread plate. And if you see the three zone technique for isolated colonies, that's a streak plate. So please know the difference between the types of plates, uh, inoculation techniques. You see, this is a good three zone streak plate for isolated colonies. Uh, remember, you want isolated colonies. Um, See, and be able to identify contaminants. Contaminants are usually not on the streak lines. Uh, c contaminants are usually found outside of the streak lines. All right, very good. Okay, pipette, pipetting and dilutions. You should know how to read a pipette. Remember, uh, from the bottom of the meniscus, that's where you measure on a pipette. So this would, the, the proper value here would be 7.9, you know, because you're looking at the bottom of the meniscus. Another thing you should be able to do is determine uh, dilution factor and serial dilution factor. Remember, if I transfer 0.5 mL of solution to 4.5, then my dilution factor for this tube is 0.5 over 5 or the same as 1 in 10. 1 in 10 dilution. Does that make sense? So. If I then take 1 mL of this into 9 mL of this, this dilution factor is also a 1 in 10 dilution because 1 in 9 plus 1, 10. So that would mean the first tube here is a 1 in 10 dilution. The second tube here is a 1 in 10 dilution. And then you multiply. 1 in 10 times 1 in 10 equals 1 in 100 dilution. And remember, another way of writing 1 in 100 is 1 over 10 to the 2. 1 over 10 to the 2 is the same as saying 1 over 100. Also, you could say 10 to the minus 2. That's also the same thing as saying 1 in 100. So did you follow that? 1 over 100 equals 1 in 10 to the 2 equals 10 to the minus 2. They all mean the same thing. Uh, that, that will help you with this. That shortcut will help you a lot. And then remember the the standard plate formula this is very important stuff the standard plate formula which is on page working dilution problems oh hey hi wicket wicket's come to say hi um he might come into view in a minute but he's sitting here next to my textbook wicket say hi wicket wicket's just uh being curious all right so let me show you i want you to know the um, 
standard plate formula. Do you remember the standard plate formula? Yes. Uh, actually, I think it was back here. Yes. A mountain sample. No, that's not it. That is diluent. It's, it's basically right here. This is the standard plate formula. You take number of colonies on the countable plate. So remember here, uh, if you do a serial dilution and plate out the serial dilution, we had too many to count, too many to count. Then we had the countable plate with 71 counts. Then we had a, a plate with too few to count and zero. So you keep, you count only the countable plate, 71. Remember it has to be, the values have to be between 30 and 300. Uh, so here 71 is fine, 71 colonies divided by the total dilution of the tube that made that plate. So in this case, it would be the 1 over 10 to the 3 or 1 in 1,000 dilution plate. And then you also multiply it by the amount or volume that you plated. So here it would be 71 colonies divided by 1 over 10 to the 3 times 1. Um, uh, so when you when you want to sort these out sorry gizmo is in my my way i i actually can't see the screen because gizmo's actually sitting right in front of the screen and playing and dropping things off the table are you going to chase it okay he chased <laughs> he jumped off the table okay so let's get back to this so 71 colonies over 10 to the 3 why why is it 1 over 10 to the 3 because it was the 1 over 1,000 or 1 over 10 to the 3, also known as the one, uh, 10 to the minus 3 uh, dilution that, that ended up making this plate. Does that make sense? So this is the total dilution of the tube that made that plate. And then times 1. Why 1? Because 1 is the amount of that dilution you plated. So here, 71 uh, colonies over 1 over 10 to the 3 times 1. Here, you can bring the 10 to the 3 up because you're multiplying. Um, basically, you multiply the, the denominators and the um, inners and outers. Yeah, you, you multiply 71 times 10 to the 3, and then you multiply you know, 71 over 1, 1 times 1. This becomes 71 times 10 to the 3. Basically, you could think of it as you could bring the 10 to the 3 up. If you, if you don't remember that math trick. And you can bring the 10 to the 3 up. So it becomes 71 times 10 to the 3. But now you don't want to leave it as 71 times 10 to the 3 because you want scientific notation, meaning you want a number, uh, just one number, and then the decimal point. So you have to move the decimal over by 1. This makes the number bigger. So 7.1 times 10 to the 4, or 71,000 uh, 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 call it the cells per milliliter of original stock, right? All right, so please know this equation here. And by the way, uh, you might be asking, well, what if I only put, what if I only plated 0.1 ml instead of 1 ml? Well, then it would be 1 over 10 to the 3 times 1 over 10. Uh, that's the same thing as saying 1 over 10 to the 1. That would, first you would multiply those. Uh, so basically you add exponents. So if you if you do that 1 over 10 to the 3 times 1 over 10 to the 1 That becomes 1 over 10 to the 4 and then you would bring the 1 over 10 to the 4 up Move the decimal over and it would be 7.1 times 10 to the 5 uh, or 71 uh, 710,000 cells per mil if that makes sense So that's what you would that's what you would plug in if you had 0.1 ml that you plated instead of 1 ml. I hope this helps. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on that. But again, this is scientific notation, the rules for scientific notation. You got coefficient times base, exponent. You want only one number here uh, before the decimal point. All right. Uh, I think that about wraps it up for this chapter. Um, Trying to see if there's another question here that you might want to know. Um, I think there was just one more thing I wanted to point out from this from this activity here. Um, you see this here. 
it's two different questions for me to ask. If, if we're looking at this, this pipette here, if I were to ask you how much liquid has been uh, dispensed, that's a different question than how much liquid is in the tube, okay? Uh, or how much liquid is in the pipette. Let me explain. If I asked how much liquid is in the pipette, you would read from the bottom of the meniscus and if any of you are thinking 8.1, you're wrong, okay? Because just because this says 8 doesn't mean this is, you know, 8.1. What this means is you have dispensed. If you started at 0, if you started way up here at 0, you have dispensed 8.1 ml of liquid. However, if I were to ask you how much liquid is in this pipette, well, then you would think about how much is actually in there. So if I were to go from the bottom, the tip, if I were to go up, that's 1 ml. And then I have almost 2 ml. I have 1.9 ml in the, in the pipette tip. And I have dispensed. Dispensed means I started at the zero mark. And I've dispensed 8.1 ml. Okay, so be aware of that for the, for the uh, practical. Okay. And be able to do simple dilution factors. Like if I said... If you transfer 0.1 ml of a sample into 99.9 .9 ml of saline blank, what's the dilution? Well, it's 0.1 over uh, 100. 0.1 over 100 is the same as 1 over 1,000. So it's the 1 over 1,000 or 1 over 10 to the 3 um, dilution. Awesome. So I hope this helps. Uh, that, that's good stuff to know for the practical exam. Uh, next, we worked on hanging drop. Okay, hanging drop, remember you should know that we used a depression slide for the hanging drop activity, um, a depression slide, and that allowed us to do the hanging drop assay for modal bacteria. And do you recall also, before I forget, um, there were two types of motility that I wanted you to know about, right? Flagellar motility, this is where you have runs and tumbles run and tumble motility with a flagella. And then there was fake motility. Remember, pseudo motility, where the bacteria, the S. aureus, appeared to be shaking in place. That was not a real form of motility. Remember, that was called Brownian motion. So you should know the concept of Brownian motion, that it's not a real type of motility. And, and you should know what causes Brownian motion. Remember, water molecules kind of bouncing into each other and bouncing into the sample it makes the sample look like it's kind of vibrating in place. Okay, and then remember the flagellar stains. You should know the type of trichus arrangement. Atrichus means without a flagella. Monotrichus means one flagella. Polar monotrichus means the flagella is at one end. Lopotrichus means a tuft. Uh, like a tuft of flagella at one part at one site on the on the uh, on the bacteria. Uh, sometimes lophotrichus means a tuft at each end, but usually that's not the case. It's just at one end. Um, Amphitrichus, you have one flagella at each end. Um, you got peritrichus, which means you are completely surrounded by flagella. Okay, so please note the types of flagellar arrangement. Uh, then we had TTC motility assay. Remember TTC motility in this type of assay. Remember that you were using tetrazoleum dye. Please know the term tetrazoleum dye. Uh, it's a type of salt that turned red when reduced. Remember when the bacterium uh, grow, the bacterium reduced their environment. This changes the tetrazoleum dye to a red color where the bacterium are growing. And remember, if we hop over here, I'll try to find that real quick. All right, here it is, TTC motility agar. Remember, here you used a straight needle uh, to inoculate. You dipped the needle directly into the deep, the agar deep, the TTC agar deep, and then directly back up. And then after incubation, if the bacterium remained directly along that stab line, this was indicative of a non-modal bacteria. However, if you saw diffuse uh, red uh, staining near the stab line uh, and away from the stab line, 
this was indicative of a modal bacterium. You see the modal bacterium versus non-modal bacterium. Very good. All right, well, that's it for TTC motility. Please remember the term tetrazoleum. All right, bacterial isolates from sponge. Uh, I can't think of anything that was particular to that lab that might be, you know, juicy material for the practical, but if it comes to me, I'll, I'll let you know. Let's move on to uh, gram staining. Gram staining. Please know about gram staining. Know all, all of the reagents. Be able to re recite all of the reagents in order. So remember the primary stain was called crystal violet. Then you had the mordant iodine. Then you had the decolorizer acetone alcohol. And then you had your counter stain or secondary stain, which was safranin. Please know it in that order. Also know what a mordant is. What exactly is a mordant? A mordant is a substance that keeps a dye in place. In the case of the gram stain, it decreases the permeability of the dye by forming a iodine crystal violet complex, keeping the dye inside of the peptidoglycan layer better by making it a bigger molecule. What else about the gram stain would I like to know? You should know what a positive gram stain looks like. Remember, the purple cells are positive. You should know that a negative gram stain, the cells are pink or a light red, pink. Okay, spore stain. You should know about the endospore stain. Uh, here, the endospores are green dots, right? Uh, let, me, let me actually show you. All right, take a look. This is what I was talking about with gram stain. Um, here you can see purple cells. This is indicative of positive, gram positive cells, and these look like staphylococcal arrangement. Here are these pink cells. These are indicative of gram negative. Now, hop over to spore, spore stain. Remember, you see the little green dots? Those are the endospores. And the red cells, these are the vegetative cells. So. Within the red vegetative cell, you have the endospore inside. Okay, now what else do you need to know about the endospore stain? So not just uh, can you spot endospores and tell me if this bacterium is a spore former or not a spore former. You should know why we heat the, the, the uh, bacterium during, uh, remember during malachite green, during primary staining we heat the bacterium. This is to open up the pores in the, sp in the spore and allow the stain to enter the spore. Um, you should know that there isn't necessarily a decolorizer during the spore stain. Remember, we just wash it with water. Uh, water is ba essentially the decolorizer. Um, you, could, you could be correct saying there is no decolorizer or water is the decolorizer. And then remember the secondary stain is your saffron in here all right so you have uh you know there is no there is no decolorizer the primary dye is malachite green there is no decolorizer water is the decolorizer and then you have your saffron in oh and um that is about it that is about it for the spore stain and remember i don't know if anyone will ask this, but remember there are two genuses of bacterium known for forming endospores, the clostridium and the bacillus uh, genuses. Okay, what else do we need? Acid fast stain. All right, for the acid fast stain, I need you to know what makes a bacterium acid fast. Acid fast bacterium, uh, one of the major genuses is mycobacterium. And what you need to know is that acid fast bacterium have mycolic acids in their cell walls, mycolic acids. And these mycolic acids give the cells this waxy, this, uh, this, this, 
a cell wall that's that's difficult to stain and because it's difficult to stain that's why we use uh, heat to drive the primary dye carbol fusion which is a hot pink dye into the waxy lipid cell wall okay so we need to know that the that we need to use heat to get the the carbol fusion primary dye into the cell hot pink is indicative of acid fast cells and a light blue because you know the counter stain is is uh, malachite green um, uh, I'm sorry the counter stain is uh, methyl blue uh, it, it's a blue stained negative acid fast cell okay also the decolorizer is called acid alcohol or HCl alcohol does that make sense so primary dye needs heat to get into the waxy mycolic acid cell wall uh, primary dye is called carbol fusion then the decolorizer is called acid alcohol or HCl alcohol and then the secondary dye is uh, methyl blue which is a light blue dye that's the counter stain or secondary stain okay so be able to identify non acid fast and acid fast bacterium under the microscope very good um, and we talked about flagellar stains please know about these flagellar arrangements um, let's see capsule stain let's let's know about the capsule stain as well what do we want to know about the capsule stain remember that the capsule stain is a type of negative staining you need to know that the capsule stain is a negative staining it means that negative staining means that you're you're staining everything except the the object that you want to view right so here you're staining the glass you see here you stain the glass pink the slide pink and you stain the bacteria pink so what's not stained is the these little halos these little clear halos which are your capsules the reason your capsules don't stain you should know is because capsules are non-ionic or they are uncharged not polar they are non-ionic and because they're non-ionic they don't take up the stain and they remain unstained here on the right you can see an example of a bacterium with no capsule the the back got the background got stained pink or sorry I'm pur purple the bacteria is purple but you don't see these halos and because you don't see the little halos like you do here this would be a non capsule forming bacteria on the right and a capsule forming bacteria on the left all right where are we at with this we talked about acid fast capsule back gram stain okay bacterial colony morphology let's talk about that here we go bacterial colony morphology you should realize that different bacterium species grow with a different bacterial colony morphology so here just by looking at this plate I can tell you that there are numerous different species of bacteria on this plate and I believe they've counted eight you know you can see one two they're all numbered eight different bacterial species on this plate again each species of bacteria grows with a different colony morphology so if you if I were to give you on the practical a plate uh, like this and say how many different species are on this plate are represented on this plate one two three or four or greater what would what would you say well you you should say four or greater because there's like eight different types of colonies on this plate based on their morphology does that make sense but what if I gave you a plate and it had you know two different types like like the type here that's labeled three and then the type here that's labeled four and the whole plate looked like three and four uh, what would you say about that plate is that a um, is that a pure culture on that plate no that plate represents two different species of bacteria on that plate does that make sense so you know if you see different looking morphology on a plate that is indicative of different species on that plate and that plate is not a pure culture there isn't a pure culture on that plate 
All right, and you should know that bacterial, bacterial colony morphology is judged by uh, the whole shape of the colony, the size of the colony, you've got edge and margin of the colony, chromiogenesis, which means color of the colony and pigmentation of the colony, opacity of the colony, is it clear, is it transparent, is it translucent, elevation of the colony, surface of the colony, consistency or texture of the colony. And these are the uh, these are the, the characteristics of a colony, the different characteristics of a colony. Now, what I don't need you to know particularly is to know all the different types of shape. Like you don't need to know that filamentous versus rhizoid versus curled. You don't need to know all the different types of edge or colony margin. You don't need to know all the different types of elevation. But you should know at least that different colonies have a different appearance based on their species they represent. And, you know, these are the general categories by which they are classified here. Okay, so that's it for colony morphology. Let's see what else we're dealing with here. Isolation of an antibiotic producer from soil. From that lab, again, I want you to remember the standard plate formula. Remember, the, remember that whole plate formula. Number of cells on the countable plate divided by the total dilution factor times the amount plated. Uh, same thing there. Fungi. What do I want you to know about fungi? Well, let's go here to fungi. Um, fungi. What do I need you to know about fungi? There are certain things. Uh, the basidiomycetes are the mushrooms. Uh, the mushrooms are a great repre uh, representation uh, of the basidiomycetes. Ascomycetes are the sac fungi. These include penicillium. Saccharomyces, zygomycetes, this is represented by rhizopus. I, I need you to know rhizopus for sure. Remember rhizopus dolonifer? That is the bread mold. And uh, yeast, yeast have this semi round appearance, semi circular, kind of oblong, oval shaped uh, appearance. You need to know about, yes. This is Rhizophis dolonifer. Remember bread mold? What you need to know for the practical, you should know that the bread mold, the Rhizophis dolonifer, has asexual spores that form like this. This is called the sporangia. Sporangia. This, this is a telltale asexual spore for the uh, Rhizophis. Whereas the sexual spores occur when two hyphae of different mating types uh, meet, right? And then uh, uh, zygote forms. So this is called a uh, zygospore, a zygospore, which is a sexual spore. And then here, this is called a sporangiospore. Remember here, this is the same thing here and here. These are the asexual uh, sporangiospores. This is the sexual zygospore. So please know the difference. Now let's talk about the conidia from penicillium versus aspergillus. The, the conidia are the pattern of the spores at the tip of the hyphae for penicillium versus aspergillus. What I want you to know is that the conidia have a finger-like projection for penicillium. You see how they kind of all point the same direction, like a like kind of like a broom or something or fingers. Whereas in aspergillus, I want you to realize that with aspergillus, it fans out a lot more. You know, you have a lot more fanning out of those conidia spores. Okay, those are the main things to know here. And, you know, you may want to also know what's the difference between, um, uh, like, at least, can you, can you list at least one difference between mold and yeast? And remember, yeast grow with a semicircular uh, cell shape whereas mold grow with a hyphal or filamentous cell shape. Okay, those are the important things I'd like you to know for the practical. All right, let's go back to our course schedule here and see if what, if, what else we need to cover. All right, that led us to identification of Staphylococcus. Uh, remember, uh, one thing I need you to know is that Staphylococcus aureus is pretty distinct in that it grows with a golden pigmentation. So if you see a colony 
on a plate and it has a golden pigmentation, especially if it's a high salt plate, you know, which selects for halophilic bacteria or haloduric bacteria, that's probably Staphylococcus aureus. Aureus is the one with the golden pigmentation. And by the way, you should know the terms halophile, haloduric. This, this means that bacterium that can grow on the high salt conditions in the high salt. All right, now we talked about these different types of tests, catalase, oxidase, mannitol salt. So let's go through these different tests. And to do so, I'm gonna bring up the, um, the information that I had thrown on the board and I will have the manual set up. So let me set those things up. And uh, in fact, this is a good time for break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let me set up for explaining these and we'll be right back with that explanation. Hey everyone, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's go ahead and continue on with our practical one exam review. Uh, we did the oxidase test, remember, and what I wanted you to know about the oxidase test is that it tests for various types of oxidase enzyme that are produced by a bacterium, specifically cytochrome oxidase. If a bacterium is cytochrome oxidase positive, then the oxidase reagent will turn blue or purple within a short amount of time. Uh, and remember the if the, if the bacterium is oxidase negative, then the reagent should appear clear. Okay, uh, that's about all I needed you to know about the oxidase. And you need to read the reaction within 30 seconds because otherwise they could have a false positive, a false uh, positive result. All right, other than that, um, oh yes, the peroxidase test, uh, or catalase test, I should call it. We did a catalase test, and remember that the reagent, you need to know that the reagent for the catalase test is hydrogen peroxide, because hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, will react with the enzyme catalase, and catalase will break hydrogen peroxide into oxygen, which bubbles, and water. And so a positive test is uh, indicated by the presence of bubbling. If you see bubbling, that's indicative of a positive cat uh, catalase test. If you see no bubbling, that's indicative of a negative catalase test. Okay, so please know that the reagent is hydrogen peroxide and catalase positive, there's bubbling, catalase negative, no bubbling. All right, let's move on. Now, we did a number of other tests as well, which I want to touch on. I want you to know about the Durham tube and what is the Durham tube. You should know that the Durham tube is an inverted tube in, the, uh, in, in various test tubes, actually. It's an inverted small test tube. The Durham tube is there to trap gas. It's, uh, you can see gas collected by the Durham tube. Okay. Um, during the nitrate test, you should know that nitrate test is a test to uh, determine the outcome of, you know, the fate of nitrate. So you started with NO3 nitrate. You wanted to determine whether there was no reduction so that nitrate remained nitrate. You wanted to determine whether nitrate was reduced to nitrogen gas. You wanted to determine whether nitrate became nitrite or nitrate became ammonia. So recall you added the reagents and you should know that the reagents are called Barrett's A and B. If you added Barrett's A and B and it turned red, I believe that was positive for nitrite, you know, to NO3 nitrate reduction to nitrite. However, if it remained clear, then you went on to the second test uh, to, to add zinc. And if you added zinc and it turned red, that was indicative of no reduction. The nitrate remained nitrate. If you added zinc and it turned and it remained clear, that was indicative of ammonia or NH3. 
And how do you know if you had N2 gas? Well, you check for a bubble in the Durham tube. If you had a bubble in the Durham tube, you could have determined you have nitrogen gas without having to do any of these reagents, any of these tests. And the DNA plate, remember, this was a mint green plate. And uh, what you should know is that you get this halo, you, you get this clearing around the bacterial colony where you can pretty much see through the plate where the green color is gone and you've got this clear halo around the bacterial streak. Here, that's indicative of DNA positive bacterium, bacterium that produce the exoenzyme DNA. If the mint color is uh, not uh, broken down, you know, the, meth uh, the malachite green methyl uh, color, the, the, the green color is still in the plate. This is indicative of DNA negative uh, uh, colonies. If the if the halo is not present, is what I'm saying. If the halo is not present, and the green color goes right up to the colony, this is a negative DNA plate. If you see a halo or a clearing, that is a positive result for DNA. And I'm sorry if I said uh, malachite green. It's methyl green, methyl green dye. The methyl green dye gets broken down when DNA is present. Uh, here, this is an example of a, uh, remember please, that this is a differential plate, not a selective plate, a differential plate. Why? Because bacteria will grow. If there is a halo, that's indicative of DNA positive. If there is no halo, that's DNA DNA negative. So this is a differential plate. And if I were to ask you, what is the differential medium here? you would say DNA, which is mixed in with the agar, as well as the methyl green uh, dye that's mixed in with the agar as well. Then mannitol salt, mannitol salt plate. Uh, this plate is both selective and differential. Remember the mannitol salt, both selective and differential. What does selective mean? You should know that selective plates or selective media in general uh, they select against, which means they block the growth of one type of organism, and they select for, which means they permit the growth of another type of organism. So why is the mannitol salt agar plate selective? Because it has salt, high salt concentration, you know, like five to, uh, or more percent salt concentration. Only halophiles or haloduric bacteria can grow in salty conditions like that. Okay, so non-halophiles will not grow. They're selected against. Halophiles will grow. They are selected for. And what's the differential agent? What's the differential agent? The, well, that's uh, phenol red uh, plus mannitol. Phenol red and mannitol. Phenol red is a color indicator, which is red in neutral pH and turns yellow in an acidic pH. And mannitol is a type of sugar. So what we're testing for is the ability to ferment mannitol. The bacteria can break down mannitol. They will release, uh, you know, they will they will reduce their environment, which will change the pH to an acidic environment. Uh, and the phenol red will change yellow. So uh, it's not actually this plate. So um, I can show you a plate. Hold on. Let me show you. Um, let me show you. Look here. Um, it, the mannitol salt plate is a pink, uh, a reddish pink plate. If the bacteria grows, it's halophilic or haloduric. If the bacteria grows and there is yellowing in the media, the media is turning yellow, that's indicative of mannitol use. If the bacteria grow, uh, but there is no yellowing of the med media, no yellow color shift or color change, then the bacteria is not a mannitol user. Okay, I hope that helps clear things up for you. Okay, let's move on to the SM110 plate. SM110 plates are simply selective plates. 
they are selective because they are high salt plates. Only halo files or halo duric will grow. What is a Columbia naledixic acid plate? This is also known as the CNA plate. It's both selective and differential. It's selective because it has naledixic acid, which is a type of antibiotic that at lower concentrations prevents gram-negative bacteria from growing. So gram-negative bacteria are selected against, gram-positive bacteria are selected for. Only gram-positives will grow. However, it's also a differential plate because it has blood agar. Blood agar. There's, a, there's sheep's blood mixed in with the, with the agar. So why? So you can visualize hemolysis. Certain bacteria can release uh, hemolysins. These are enzymes that can break down blood. And you could have either no hemolysis, which is called a, a gamma hemolysis, gamma hemolysis. You could have complete hemolysis, which is, which is beta hemolysis. Or you could have partial hemolysis, which is called alpha hemolysis. So here you can see I drew here a blood agar plate. And if the, if the agar looks great and the colony is growing, uh, obviously, you know that's a gram-positive bacteria because this, the naledixic acid would select against gram-negative. So this gram-positive colony is a gamma uh, hemolytic bacterium, which means it does not lyse blood cells. This uh, gram-positive colony, if you see there's a halo, there's a clearing, there's a clearing in the, in the agar around the colony, where the blood cells have actually broken down and they're no longer a red zone around the colony. If there's a clear halo where you could actually even see through the plate if you held it up to the light, that's called beta hemolysis. And then here, if you get a bruising effect, like a brown, yellow, green, kind of like a purple brown, you know, like a bruise color uh, around the colony, that's alpha hemolysis, okay? That is alpha hemolysis. And then you had your carbohydrate tests. Do you remember the carbohydrate tests? Uh, you had uh, lactose in a tube. You had uh, mannitol, dextrose. You had, uh, uh, there was another, sucrose. So remember, this had the same phenol red color indicator that we talked about before. Phenol red is, is a red color at neutral pH, and it turns yellow when the pH is dropped uh, to acidic, uh, which is indicative of, of uh, fermentation. If the bacteria cannot ferment the sugar, so remember each one of these test tubes had uh, broth with the phenol red color indicator and a type of sugar, mannitol or sucrose, what have you. If the bacteria could not break down the sugar, the, the tube stayed red stayed red, which is negative for carbohydrate use. If the, if the bacteria could break down the sugar, this, this changed the pH to acidic, which changed the color to yellow, and the yellow was positive for color change. Also, you could check for bubbles. Remember, certain ones had a durum tube. If you see gas, if you see a little bubble inside of the durum tube, that's indicative of gas. That's gas for uh, formation. All right, so that covers a bunch of our staph ID, um, staphylococcal ID. Uh, let's see, there was more. There was another one I had here. Yes, here, coagulase test. Remember the coagulase test? Um, coagulase test consisted of 5% rabbit plasma. Please know that the coagulase test consists of rabbit plasma because certain bacterium can produce coagulase or not. Uh, this is a test for the enzyme coagulase, which causes rabbit plasma to coagulate, which causes it to clump up. So remember, we, we went over this in the lab, a positive result is clumping. Remember, you hold the test tube straight up and you hold it a little bit, you tilt it like, uh, you know, just less than 90 degrees. You tilt the, the rabbit plasma. If the rabbit plasma is moving around like water inside of, the uh, inside of the tube, then that's indicative of a negative coagulase result. However, 
if the coagulase, remember if it has the lumpiness to it, almost like mucus or mucosal uh, consistency in there, that's positive for coagulase, positive for coagulase if, the, if there's clumping. Then there was the ONPG test. Remember this tests for beta galactosidase. Um, the bacteria have to be grown in lactose ahead of time. Remember, so bacteria have to be grown in lactose ahead of time before they are uh, used to in, 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 inoculate the ONPG test. And then ONPG is broken down into the yellow product, O nitrophenol, which is a yellow product. So if you have a yellow product in the ONPG test, that is a positive ONPG test. If you have a clear product, um, then that's negative for ONPG, for beta-galactosidase. Great. Uh, I, we also did the mead activity, but I don't know of anything that would be specific to mead that I need you to know for the exam. That was a, just a fun activity for us to do. Uh, let's see if I've touched on everything here. I have touched on everything, and now we are off to water analysis. I, I don't know of anything in particular off the top of my head that we're including in the practical for water analysis, but if it, if it dawns on me, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, let's move on. We haven't had a chance. See, the practical is coming up. We have not had a chance to observe our results for Kirby Bauer. So uh, we are going to shift Kirby Bauer to the next pro, uh, practical exam, practical exam number two, antimicrobials as well. Uh, but we did cover algae and protozoa. So let's talk about the algae and let's talk about the protozoa real quick. Let me find those here. Okay, protozoa. What I need you to know about the protozoa is that they are categorized by their mechanism of motility. Okay, they are, they are categorized by a variety of factors, cell architecture, motility, even hosts. But mainly, I need you to know about their motility. Remember, the amoebas are uh, categorized by their pseudopod motility. The flagellates are characterized by their flagellated motility. Ciliates, these have cilia. And AP complexins, these are obligate intracellular parasites. So they have no motility. They are intracellular or inside of the cell parasites. I need you to know uh, to, how to identify these organisms, plasmodium, paramecium, trypanosoma, amoeba so here you go let's look at some examples uh, amoeba are always changing shape remember because of their plasma membranes always changing shape that's what pseudopod mo motility looks like so they never look the same way twice they're always changing shape this is amoeba with pseudopod motility paramecium look like little torpedoes paramecium with their ciliated motility I, I need you to know what those look like here's trypanosoma what you're seeing here, by the way, with trypanosoma, you're seeing red blood cells. These are all little red blood cells. There's hundreds of red blood cells here. But these purple whip-like structures, they look like, like a whip. These purple structures are your trypanosoma. So their trypanosoma are parasites. They live in your blood fluids, but they don't live inside of your red blood cells. They live next to your red blood cells in your blood fluid. These are trypanosoma with their flagellated motility. Plasmodium, on the other hand, they live inside of those red blood cells. You see, the, in this case, they are inside of the red blood cells. This little ring-like structure, that's the plasmodium uh, parasite inside of your bigger red blood cell. So here's another blood cell, and inside you can see two plasmodium. Here's another, here's another with the plasmodium inside. So here's a red blood cell with no plasmodium inside infecting the cell. Okay, so please know for the for the exam how to identify plasmodium how to identify trypanosoma how to identify uh, ciliates like the paramecium how to identify amoeba right these are the big ones to know for the exam so please know those and know that they are categorized by the motility that they exhibit as well okay 
Now, moving on to, what was it, algae? Yes, algae is our last concept from the practical. Let's go ahead and touch on that. And then I'll give you some more pointers and we'll call it a day. Let's see. Um, let me go to the algae. Um, what is a type of spirogyra? All right, here we go. Algae. Now, what do I need you to know about algae? These are photosynthetic uh, organisms, photosynthetic protists. And one type I want you to know is uh, Volvox. I want you to know the shape of Volvox. It looks like a big ball with smaller balls inside, Volvox. Euglena, Euglena which is a flagellated type of uh, algae. Spirogyra. Spirogyra look like um, filaments. They're filamentous in shape and they have this zigzag pattern inside. They're very beautiful to look at. Diatoms look like small crystals because they have a frustrule of silica, a glass, a glass uh, cell wall essentially. And then the anabena. Anabena look like pearl necklaces of green color, right? Pearl necklaces of green color. It's a type of cyanobacteria, anabena. Okay, so here are your algae. Uh, most are eukaryotic. These four on the top are eukaryotic. And the one in the bottom, anabena, is a type of cyanobacteria. Actually, it's prokaryotic, all right? So those are the ones to identify for the exam. And let's go back. That about covers up, covers all the material. Oh, one thing I need you to know about is the, um, before I forget, uh, one thing that uh, comes up often are the equipment we used in the lab. Do you remember we used a Quebec counter? Remember that Quebec counter? It is used to count colonies. It is also used to observe colony morphology. So you should know about the Quebec counter. Another piece of equipment we used in the lab, if you remember, was um, uh, another piece of equipment we used was the spectral photometer. Oh, by the way, um, we didn't talk about that. Bacterial, um, didn't we count bacteria as well? We had a lab where we counted the number of bacteria. Bacterial numbers. We skipped this lab. Let me go to bacterial numbers. And, and I'm glad I remembered this because that was a big lab we did. Um, find uh, spectrophotometry. Okay. Bacterial numbers. Now, I want you to know a few things about bacterial numbers lab. Remember, there's two types of bacterial counts we did. One was called the standard or viable plate count method. Remember we did the serial dilution and then we plated some set amount into plates and we've already kind of talked about this before. Remember we did a serial dilution of the E. coli. This was the 10 to the minus 2 dilution or 1 in 100 dilution. This was the 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8 dilution and then we we, we seeded either 1 ml or 0.1 ml of these dilutions here. And then we looked for the countable plate and then we did the standard formula, standard plate formula to figure out the number of cells per, per mil in the original E. coli. Remember CFU in the original E. coli population. Uh, and the equation for the standard plate formula was number of colonies or, or CFUs on this countable plate between 30 and 300 divided by dilution, total dilution factor times the amount plated. We already kind of touched on this earlier, but what I need you to know is that um, on the viable plate count, it only counts for uh, living cells. Remember, this type of assay only, t uh, only counts living viable cells that can grow in the media. It does not count for dead cells, for instance. Whereas the other plate, the other count type was called uh, turbidimetric. Where is that? Yeah, it's it's based on absorbance or optical density. It's called the turbid turbidimetric count. Remember the turbidity counts, and this counts 
biomass. What you need to know is with the turbidity counts, with the spectrophotometer, remember what turbidity means? It means how cloudy with cells, how cloudy is your broth. Uh, if you have just sterile media, fresh sterile media, uh, it's very clear. You can see right through the TSB media. But if the bacteria are growing in that broth, remember the broth gets cloudier and cloudier and cloudier. That's what turbidity refers to. The more cloudy the broth, the more saturated it is with biomass of bacteria, and the, the, the more bacteria are present in that tube. Now, what you need to know is during the turbidity assay, you're just asking how much light is blocked by that turbid fluid. So you're going to count living cells, you're going to count dead cells, you're going to count any cells, right? Biomass. You're, you're, so again, during the plate count method, you're only counting living cells that grow on the plate, whereas during the turbidimetric count, you're counting living and dead cells. And because of that, you're going to get inflated numbers. You're going to get a higher value with your turbidimetric count than you do with your viable plate count, if that makes any sense. What else do I want you to remember from this lab? I want you to know why we use the spectrophotometer. Um, do you remember we, we placed a TSB uh, uh, control, just plain TSB control into the spectrophotometer to calibrate the absorbance to zero, and then we placed our E. coli samples. Remember we placed uh, the, the one out of one E. coli samples, the one half diluted E. coli sample, the one quarter diluted E. coli sample, and the one sixteenth diluted E. coli sample into the spectrophotometer. And what, and what I need you to know for the practical is what did the spectrophotometer measure? Remember, it measures absorbance. How much light is blocked by that E. coli sample, by the turbidity? turbidimetric mass, right, the, the biomass inside of that sample. Okay, and based on that, based on that, remember you got a standard curve. Remember the standard curve you got? Um, the, the reason you made that standard curve is that from then on, once you've made the standard curve, you can guesstimate the number of colonies, uh, or I should say the number of bacteria in any other sample based on absorbance. So for the practical, for instance, if I were to give you this graph, this graph right here, and then I said, well, what if I gave you a sample and that sample had 0 0.06 absorbance? How many bacteria are in that sample based on this, based on this uh, standard curve? How would you answer that? Well, remember I said, I gave you a sample that's 0 0.06 absorbance. Well, I could use this standard curve here that I've, I've, I've put together by going from 0 0.06 absorbance, I could go up till I reach the point on the line, and then I could go across to 15. So 15 is my value, but look here, it says number of bacteria times 10 to the 5. So it's actually, my answer is not just 15, it would be 15 times 10 to the 5. So I have 15 times 10 to the 5 bacteria, per ml. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a neat little trick. Uh, that's what I'd, I'd like you to be able to do on the practical as well. Okay, so again, the spectrophotometer measures absorbance. If I were to give you this type of graph and give you an absorbance, could you give me, with the proper units, the number of bacteria per ml? Um, do you know the difference between uh, uh, colony count and a turbidimetric count. Remember, one counts just viable cells, one counts viable and dead cells, or biomass in general. Do you know what a Quebec colony counter is? Remember, a Quebec colony counter. Um, do you know how to use the standard plate formula with the countable plate to determine CFUs? You know, those are the main concepts that we need to know. Awesome. So, uh, Hopefully that's a good review there. Now let's go back here and see if there's anything else off the top of my mind that I want you to, guys to be aware of or that might help you on the practical exam. I think I've touched on everything. You know, I've reached to the furthest crevices of my brain to, to try to grasp for anything else that might be of use for you. 
and I, I believe that I believe that I've touched on as much as I can recall I don't believe I've left anything out and if I have left things out it's not intentional uh, again the the best way to study for the practical is to go through all your old uh, activities um, always ask yourself you know what was this test for what does a positive result look like what does a negative result look like what's the counter stain called what's the what's the primary stain what's the decolorizer is there a decolorizer uh, is the, you know what's a negative stain what is you know quiz yourself on all these different concepts but I feel like you're well prepared if you've been following along with this uh, review I just did for you right here if you've been following along nodding and and you know um, you know and things are making sense I think you're in good shape for this practical exam um, I think I think we've touched on all the important parts I'm just looking through to make sure I, I've touched on everything uh, but I feel pretty strong I feel like like you are pretty well prepared if you've uh, followed that advice again please study all the material don't just go off of this review I'm trying to remember all the important things for you to understand but the best way to ensure that you do the best possible is to go through and study all the material all the old pictures you took of all the different samples you know and and you know go off of that but yeah uh, I, I really don't know what else I could throw in here um, for this review I, I feel like I've touched on everything I, I really really hope that you do well please study hard remember that the practical exam has 50 blank spaces and you might have to recall and be able to spell things like tetrazoleum you might have to recall you know I might ask you what is the what is the primary stain of the acid fast stain and you have to remember that you know it's not multiple choice you might have to remember that that's called carbol fusion and write out carbol fusion you know so be able to recall terms and try to spell them correctly I will be a little bit lenient with spelling you know uh, try to spell things correctly recall things don't think that everything on the practical will be multiple choice because oftentimes it's not it's re do you recall the term you know do you know what a mordant is do you know what what the function of a mordant is just quiz yourself uh, over and over again okay uh, uh, I think that's about it uh, I hope I didn't forget anything um, but uh, I, I, I feel like this was a solid review hopefully it was useful to you let me know in the comments below if you have any questions and I'll try to answer and uh, I wish you the best on your exam and I will see you guys next time Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D a doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D.